It all started with some yo-yos. Uh, what did? This episode did, in a way. It's all about a little community library in Dubai that can trace its antecedents back to some yo-yos. There was a soldiers in Sharjah, one officer of whom wrote to his grandmother and said that awful place Sharjah was and how he was bored stiff. And his grandmother went round to Harrods and bought 12 yo-yos, these things that went up and down, yeah. and um, sent them. And the officer said, my grandmother has gone off her head. We don't play yo-yos on the army officers. This was in 1969 when Lady Margaret Bullard almost unknowingly laid the Biblio Foundations for the Old Library, a much-loved community space for English-language books that has been kept alive by its members, volunteers and collection of books for adults and children. A few weeks ago, she was in Dubai to celebrate its 50th anniversary. From Amaya Media, this is Karama Sutra, chronicles from communities we've grown up with. I'm Vanita Bhardwaj. And I'm Chirag Desai. For today's episode, we enlisted the help of Yara Badri, an avid book enthusiast with an extraordinary heart for words. Yara has the most gorgeous Instagram profile called People of the Pages that's dedicated to all things books and words. Yara spoke to Lady Margaret when the 90-year-old was in Dubai. Hello. Hello. <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet you. It's a great pleasure to be in Dubai again. <laughs> and we're sitting in the old library, which is an institution that you were central to founding back in the late 60s, before the UAE was even the UAE. Right, it was called the Trucial States. <laughs> it was the Trucial States, yes. So the Trucial States is what the British call the Group of Confederations, now basically the UAE and Oman, that had entered into agreements or truces with the British government all the way back in 1820. As European countries built up their trade with the Far East, they came to know this shore of the Gulf as the Pirate Coast, where valuable cargoes often disappeared without trace. Finally, Britain offered to protect the states from outside interference in return for guarantees that the piracy would stop. The Pirate Coast became the Trucial Coast. And by 1968, the UK announced their intention to withdraw, eventually revoking the agreement in 1971, which is why last week, on the 2nd of December, the UAE celebrated its 48th National Day. I want to take you back, actually, to that time. So you came to Dubai as a result of your husband's job as a political agent based at the British Embassy. No, just the agency. Called the agency at that time. Mm. And so I want you to describe the Dubai at that, of that time to our listeners. Was it as you expected? I arrived... Um, in a very bad state. I'd been in Lebanon, and I had swum in a, with my children in a nasty, dirty pool up in the mountains, and all our legs had turned up in boils. And people said, oh, you can't go to Dubai like that. I mean, it's the end of the world, Dubai. I mean, you'll get some terrible disease. And so I was not going to stay any longer without my husband because he'd gone ahead. And I came, and he said... We'll go and swim. And the next day, boils completely disappeared. And I've never had illness of any kind all the time I was in Dubai. I was lucky to have the first house which had central um, air conditioning and uh, had a swimming pool and a tennis court. And uh, I think most people had a machine on the window which made a rather nasty noise or a wind tower. And some of the... um, Arab ladies I know knew who lived in, in the Bastaki area. I remember one of them saying, would you like to come and see my kitchen? I said, yes, I would. And she is kitchen in the open air, <laughs> in the passage in the Bastaki area. <laughs> and she showed me how to make an Arab dish. I can't remember what it was now at this moment. Did you feel very welcomed by the community? I mean, how was that coming as an oh, expat well, There were so that few of us, so we were all so friendly. Yes. Uh, and now, of course, is much more impersonal and, and silent. I am staying in a hotel here, and the silence up at the top is amazing. Yeah. The roads were... There was just one tarmac road to, Sh- to Sharjah, and the rest of the, word, the roads were just Subka, and everybody had um, Land Rovers, and I didn't realise quite how bad it was going to be, and I persuaded my husband that we should get an open 
white car with no roof. <laughs> Very dashing. <laughs> It was much easier to n know everybody, because there were fewer of us. Yes. One of the first evenings, I, we went out, we were going out to dinner with some friends, and at the, the, the first, only one bridge over the, uh, over the creek, and on the Dera side, yeah. there was some um, truck, and it was behaving rather oddly. So we stopped to see was somebody in trouble or something. It was Sheikh Rashid. And he had, uh, it was the back of the cat, was cat filled with oil drums, empty oil drums. And he was putting them round how he wanted the first roundabout to be. And that shows you something about what it was like in those days. The sides of the road had donkeys eating rubbish. <laughs> uh, it was It must quite have simple. been such an adventure for you. But not so much as it had been people who were there earlier and had... Yeah lived in Sharjah and had babies even in kind of houses made a little more than Barasti. Yes. <laughs> and my husband said when he retired and they said, which of your posts did you enjoy most? He said, to everyone's surprise, Dubai. It was a m splendid post in a splendid country. <laughs> when you were told that he was going to be posted here, what what did you think of the Dubai of, at that time? What my husband said was, have we got an atlas so we find out where it is? <laughs> Were you apprehensive? At all? No, 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 no. I'm delighted. I had been four years in Jordan. Yes. And uh, so I, I did know a bit about the Middle East and I'd yeah. been in, to Egypt and, and Lebanon. Um, but I had never been here. And my father-in-law spent his whole life in the Middle East, my husband's father. He was... Um, he lived in Turkey and in uh, Saudi Arabia, and in he was ambassador in Persia throughout the, the war. So it, so like it was a family, was a family had a Middle East connection. Progression, yes. yeah. Uh, okay, but we still don't know what happened to those yo-yos. Of course, the yo-yos. So this young officer, who was stationed at the British Royal Air Force, based in Sharjah, received the yo-yos from his grandmother, Lady Verney of Eaton Square, London. The officer, who had no use for one yo-yo, leave alone 12, gifted them to the Sharjah English Speaking School for the students to enjoy. So the headmistress made her, all the children write a thank you letter to the grandmother. And so the grandmother said, well, I'm going blind and my husband's dead, so I'll send you some books to read. But the, grand, the headmistress said, the children can't read these books, they, don't, <laughs> they can't read well enough. And so she added the books to our library. Yes. <laughs> so that's where Lady Verney came into the story. But she, I think she died before she'd ever heard of Dubai. They'd already set up a small library at their residence. So Sir Bullard agreed to be a custodian of the books, which took up three shelves across their bookcase. And my husband was called the Matamid, which means the accredited one, I think yes. you translated as. That's right. And, uh, he was considered a very important person. <laughs> or what had become of those books. <laughs> the, ten years ago, I tried to find one of the books, but I couldn't. Yeah. Um, but they were kind of serious English classics. Yes. And um, What every library needs. <laughs> <laughs> so these books that were sitting on their shelves actually landed up launching the library? Yeah, um, because the rest of their library had other paperbacks that were left behind by soldiers and others who went back home after working offshore on the oil rigs. So Lady Margaret at the time had the idea to start loaning out the books that they'd collected. By charging a nominal fee per book loan, funds could then be raised to pay for more stock. Word soon got around and that's how Dubai Lending Library, which is what it was known as back then, was born. The operations of the Dubai Lending Library quickly moved from the Bullard's residence to a commercial office across the creek in Deira. Planks and bags of sand were used as makeshift shelves and anyone who visited the library was given a cup of Arabic coffee. Books were ordered from England and flown in by the Royal Air Force to their base in Sharjah. We had the advantage in those days of having a battalion of English soldiers in Sharjah. They weren't fighting um, people here. Yes. They were merely having a training course in the desert. Um, and because they had, we had the army there, it cost nothing to send things by post or get things brought over by air. And so was that how you sourced the books? So when I was at home in England... I would go around, the second-hand books are very cheap in England, and get them in good condition, good books, and then get a few, few cases full and just tell the 
uh, the, uh, take them to an RAF station and say, take them to Sharjah. And so then we got, that was where we got a good lot of the books. Going. And I assume at that time that there was no checking, censorship? No, and I hear <laughs> that uh, some of, somebody came and found books on your shelves which shouldn't be there. There was none of that in my day, I don't think. Is that really a problem here now? So now uh, there is an authority that definitely checks all books before they get released for publication or for sale. So I can, I can imagine the diversity of books that you could have in those days. But once the UAE was formed in 1971, the free air transportation of book orders had to cease, and new stock now had to be brought in by sea. The British Embassy in Dubai, of course, offered assistance when necessary. But as the collection grew, the library moved into a space above a supermarket in Karama before it settled down in Satwa. By 1980, the library was troubled by rising rents and its volunteers went looking for the next home. They used porter cabins to store the books. The Holy Trinity Church gave them a temporary home and then they finally moved into the Dubai International Arts Centre on Jumeirah Beach Road, where it was renamed as the Old Library. What is amazing, I feel that whatever we started in the beginning um, would surely have died in all this time if you hadn't had all these, I understand they got about 40 people who give up their time yes. to run it. Yeah. And what's more, arranging the moving from one place to another because they've moved five times. And that is really trouble to, um, to move up piles of books. As a not-for-profit community library, this place has struggled to find a permanent home, but it has been, you know, the community that's kind of rallied behind it, that's kept it alive, that's... That's, that's right. Really... In England, people assume, oh, I expect the ruler paid for it, didn't they? And, and that's what I wanted to ask you, is kind of how important do you think a community library is? Because we are in the same state in England now, that is to say our, our local governments um, think of ways of... of filling the demand, people demand to have this done. Why don't they sweep the roads more? Why don't we do this? And then they think, oh, what can we economize on? Not many people have used the library. Perhaps we can do without the library. Yeah. And so we have to fight to keep it going. And once it gets going, people like going to meet each other and they usually give um, coffee and biscuits. And that was our first library. In this library, you can see these men they are not actually reading. They are the people who brought, made one cup of Arab coffee for every reader who came. <laughs> you have to find the tactics that work <laughs> to draw people in and to see the value. It's not so long ago that people said, oh, the books, now the internet, books are out, people aren't going to read anymore. Yeah. But actually, the libraries are all growing in England. When we return, Yara and I are joined by Sai, one of the old library's volunteers, to chart more of the library's journey from that one box of yo-yos to a collection of over 25,000 books, and also how are bookstagrammers growing communities of readers around the world? Support for this episode comes from Frying Pan Adventures. As you imagine the hustle and bustle along the streets of old Dubai while listening to this episode of Karama Sutra, there is really no better way to explore the city's unique blend of culture and cuisine than a tour with Frying Pan Adventures. Here's Arva Ahmed, their chief executive muncher. For me, old Dubai is like this big old scratched up pot of foods, of, of restaurants, of cultures that are being preserved by the migrants who, who moved here and made it their home. So my sister Farida and I started these food tours, these three to four hour moving feasts through parts of town that, that hold nostalgia for us. Everything from our Middle Eastern food pilgrimage to biryani taste battles to meals where you ditch the cutlery, just roll up your sleeves and go all in. We're committed to all of those delicious experiences that we have just here in our backyard in Dubai. And I can tell you from experience, it is a great way to learn more about the cultures behind the recipes, to explore the city, and meet new people over a shared love for food. Make sure you visit our website at fryingpanadventures.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Frying Pan Adventures and on Twitter at Frying Pan Tours. Listeners of the show can use the code Karama Sutra, that's K-A-R-A-M-A-S-U-T-R-A at checkout, to get a sweet 10% off on one of their tours. 
You can visit fryingpanadventures.com to learn more. Our thanks to the Frying Pan Sisters for their support of this show and Amaya Media. Welcome back. I'm Chirag and you're listening to Karama Sutra, chronicles from communities we've grown up with. Before the break, we heard from Lady Margaret Bullard, who started off what we now know is Dubai's oldest English language library. I actually thought that Lady Margaret was quite bemused by all the fuss around her association with the library. In fairness, she was quite insistent on giving credit where it's due. To the volunteers in the community? Well, yes, the various people who have kept it running for the last 50 years and ensured that in spite of the many winds of change, such as relocating, the sessions and changing reading habits, the old library remained. No, it's nothing to do with me. It's to do with all these people who, who just gave their spare time to run it all. Amazing, quite amazing. There was hardly a school in Dubai when I was here, and now I'm told there are masses of schools, and they've all got libraries. Yeah. We must start, you must call the old library. You should call yourself the first library. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's only natural that for a community library to truly thrive, it needs a dedicated community to give back as much as they're taking away from it, right? I mean, it could be in the form of time or effort, but even as members. And I think it'd be great to hear from one of the volunteers about how they've managed to keep it running through all of these challenges. Absolutely. Yara and I were able to persuade Sai Lakshmi Shivaram, who's often spotted giving generously of her time to literary events and at the old library. Sai has been a volunteer for six years, and she's currently a member of its committee, as well as responsible for the adult rostering. The old library has about 55 unpaid volunteers on their list, out of which 30 are active. Volunteers are the only reason why it's here today. I have never seen that roster list going below 50 ever. And we've had times when we've lost three, four key people in a year, one after the other one, and and suddenly it's just back. People have taken on bigger roles and someone who's been in the system for six months have ha, has gotten into the committee and taken on the role of a trainer. And, and you don't know from where they just get the energy and the drive to do it. I took on this uh, adult roster uh, secretary role only about six months ago. And we saw a lot of the evening shift volunteers going away. We were like, okay, our regular shift members have gone. How do we get them back? And then we decided we'll put up a small note on Facebook and Instagram and and in the library saying we are looking for PM volunteers. And then we had like, we didn't realize that just a small note like that could attract so many people. So it's good. I mean, we do recognize that we need to keep replacing people. And we have, uh, we, it's, it's surprising to see that there are so many people who want to give their time. Should I just put it on his account? He already has enough. Now, by the 2000s, the library's home on Jumeirah Beach Road became part of a new development, causing them to lose the space. Okay, so this is part of the old library that I do remember because they were part of DuckTac, right, at the Mall of the Emirates? That's correct. And this is also when Majid Al Futaim, a massive Emirati business conglomerate that's best known for its malls and attractions such as Ski Dubai, was building and opening the Mall of the Emirates in 2006. So they stepped in and agreed to bring in the old library as part of the mall, which was also going to host the Dubai Community Theatre and Arts Centre, which everyone knew as DuckTac. Right. So the library used to operate out of DuckTac for quite some time. So how did they land up at the location they are now? Well, they operated out of DuckTac from 2006 until 2018, when the mall announced that DuckTac would shut down at the end of the year. Which brings us to today and the library's new home at the Golden Diamond Park. So um, it was a bit of a shock because uh, DuckTac walked into the library and said, you have another two months. So that we didn't know what's going to happen. Also, unfortunately, at that time, we were under the umbrella of the Canadian University. And we wouldn't be able to look for a space without a certification or any support in the form of a, you know, umbrella of uh, the Canadian. So we lost everything. So I think for about a month or so, we were like, I think we have to just shut down. What do we do? And every volunteer was like, obviously sad that the space is going, but they tried really hard. I think every volunteer was trying to find ways of bringing it back. People were talking about, okay, I know this property person, this real estate person. Somebody else came and said that, you know, uh, I know people in the newspapers. Maybe we can talk about it. And ha- So it was there. Nobody wanted it to go, you know, just just go down. We actually offered a refund to people who had 
taken memberships because if people had started a membership in January, knowing that it'll go through till the end of the year and then bam, June, you're, you're shut. So we gave them an offer of refund. Lots of people took the money, but we also saw them all coming back. We found Golden Diamond Park because I think Emar was more than happy to take us on. It was literally, you know, brick and wall, the space that was given to us. It took us about three months to get it in order and I think we were closed for not more than five months. Fifty years on, the old library has metamorphosed into an established presence and an important memory for many who have lived in Dubai. It has served a purpose as an oasis of imagination in the desert. However, in a world where people's noses are buried in smartphones and not in books, are we headed towards a future where libraries are relegated to the pages of history? I mean, there's there's no doubt there is a charm to picking up a printed book and smelling the new pages and looking at the tint, yellow tint of an old book and reading. I think that's what sort of drives it today. And you have the old readers coming back because whatever is available in terms of a Kindle or uh, audio books, picking up a book and reading is is what drives the whole thing. Specifically in Dubai, if you if you walk into a Kinokone or a Borders and you pick up a book, it's, it's some 60, 70 bucks a piece. But if you're going to a library that charges you 200 dirhams a year and you can take up to eight books in the month, it is economical to come back to. So if you have an avid reader who, who wants to keep swallowing books, a library is a place for them to get to. How does a library ensure that it's current? Do you restock, do you buy or do you rely on donations? We restock every two months. We have a basic committee that runs the library. We also have subcommittees or smaller teams, which are called the book buying teams. And we do it. We do a trip to Kinokunia or Borders or whichever is available every two months. If there's a long list or a short list that's come out, we try and gather all of them. Plus, we do accept something called requests from our members who say that I read about this book. We also accept donations, um, provided they are they look new, and uh, they are fit for the Dubai uh, reading culture. Also, culling books that are not being used much, so we do that. So we cull and we keep adding new to the base. Which then brings me to the question of online reading communities. To you, Yara, there's a certain uniqueness to the physical space of a library or bookshop. There's that element of human contact and curation. Do you find that there is less of an echo chamber syndrome offline than there is online? I think that's a really interesting question because strangely online, I think my reading has diversified more, even though you would think that, yes, there are books that get featured, that are being pushed by publishers, that are being hyped by book influencers, Uh, And so you do see a lot of the same books. But equally, I think there are a lot of avid readers who are very conscious of the kind of times that we live in now and the need to diversify into reading women of color, different translated literature. If we talk about kind of walking into a library, I mean, like you said, it's very much in the hands of the person who's buying a book. Um, But at the same time, I know that library members are able to request. So I I don't know whether that kind of offline reading experience is more diverse. I think it's probably much less influenced by others. For you, transitioning from the offline to the online as a bookstagrammer, is that what it is? (laughs) Yeah, I guess. (laughs) You know, when I started my um, Instagram page, I didn't even know there was such a thing as Bookstagram. It literally started because I thought it would be a good way of kind of documenting and reviewing what I read. And I was the person that friends would always come to and say, what should I read next? So it was a way of kind of formalizing that. And then once you start, you realize how many other people are taking that very seriously and that there is a thing called Bookstagram. So for you transitioning from an offline book recommender to an online bookstagrammer, are you making more of an effort to be conscious of being more diverse in your selection? And has that in turn, now because you're in a position of influence, if you will, are you more conscious of that need to stray beyond your own comfort zone, for example, and and read 
books that you normally wouldn't? Yes, I think I am. Um, but I think forefront on my mind is really just putting great books, regardless of that, into the hands of, of, of people. And even more than that is not to really focus on people that already read, but I'm more interested in people that don't. Um, and so I feel like the Bookstagram community in general is very insular that way. It's, it's readers speaking to readers. So for me, it's always much easier to share something I'm enthusiastic about. And sometimes those end up being diverse reads. Um, because I think as somebody who loves books and loves words, I get that kind of inspiration from all different kinds of places. So whether it's other people I'm in contact with, whether it's from literary podcasts, whether it's from news articles and news uh, book reviews, etc. But I am conscious of not reading narrowly. You know, as much as I've heard about the library and I knew about them being in DuckTac, uh, I really had no idea until we started working on the story of its actual legacy, let alone the fact that it's been around for 50 years. And that's the most striking aspect that we kept returning to, be it Lady Margaret and how serendipitous it was for her simple gesture in 1969 to still retain a physical space with shelves and pages even after her leaving Dubai decades ago, or Sai, who talks about how the loyal group of volunteers maintain schedules that support a membership that still sits above 2,000. As you rightly said, it was more like, I have a set of books, the shelf is there, you people can share it, use it, and then it just grew. She was very uh, amused by the fact that it's called the old library because it looked brand new. <laughs> and she And she went around the library looking at the different things that we've done to it and how we've put up a very beautiful children's section and stuff like that. But in terms of connecting what she started off to what it has become today, I don't think she was able to see it. Maybe she was, uh, she's humble enough not to acknowledge it. But I, I just think that she didn't really expect it to become so big. So for her to be able to look at it and sink it in as something that she began hasn't really happened. I think it leaves me with hope that there are enough people in the world over time that have that passion to want to keep that that space and that community space open. So there must be something very fundamental about people wanting a library for people to continue to allow it to survive even through, you know, precarious times. It's moved homes a number of times over the years. It's really a testament to the fact that there is a, a love of having a space for books and that there are enough people who want to keep it going. The Old Library is currently located at the Golden Diamond Park in Dubai. You can find a link to their website in our show notes. Thank you for listening in to this episode hosted by me, Vinita Pardwaj, and produced by me, Anshurag Desai, who also edits the show. Our intern is Abhishek Venkata Subramanian. Special thanks to Yara Badri, whom you can find on Instagram as People of the Pages, Lady Margaret Bullet, and Sai Lakshmi P. Sivaram. You can listen to all of our episodes for free in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Ngami as well. And if you've enjoyed this episode, we would love to hear from you. Leave us a review or give us a shout on Instagram. We're karama.sutra. And our website is karamasutra.com. So that's K-A-R-A-M-A-S-U-T-R-A.com. We'll be back on the 8th of January, 2020. Until then, happy holidays. <laughs>